Deciding what to study as a composer can be as hard as deciding what to compose. It's easy to worry about this, but there will be more things that you listen to or study as a composer that either do not influence you at all or you, you don't even recognise consciously how they influence you. In this sense, what I propose here is not a list of things I think someone should study, which would be a ludicrous thing to do. Instead, I put forward a few pieces of advice for making what I think is a crucial part of developing an individual voice as a music maker. These include the considerations of uh, goals and objectives, so essentially why you want to compose, uh, intrinsic motivation and uh, challenging yourself and trying to be open and force uh, your development and growth as a composer. A crucial factor to consider when studying anything is objectives or goals. Determining what you want or need to achieve as a composer will help you rationalise what to study. These could take the form of long-term strategic goals such as career aspirations or short-term tactical improvements such as a perceived weakness uh, in your writing. For example, if I had aspirations to write film music and had perceived weaknesses in my harmony, uh, there is an opportunity to be, to be quite surgical about my studies. I could study the harmony of various film cues, uh, improving my knowledge of both harmony and specifically uh, harmony as it pertains to certain types of film scoring. Like with everything surrounding a, an artistically creative field, the problem with choosing is that there is too much choice. We need a way of whittling down our options and defining our aims uh, can help us do this. Our initial question can be panic-inducingly broad. What music should I study? Uh, we need to find a way of constraining our choices and giving ourselves a narrative so that we can uh, pick pieces to study with a degree of confidence, uh, linking studies to areas of weaknesses or even strengths and aspirations is a good way of giving us that uh, rationale, uh, giving us that back backstory, that reflection. Linking studies to areas of weakness or even strengths and aspirations is a good way of giving us that rationale. Having said this, much like my following pieces of advice, you should reserve efforts to uh, look laterally and beyond your objectives as well. What I mean by this is do not look solely at the music most relevant to your aims. Uh, using the previous example, looking at film music alone to become a film composer, in my opinion, should be likened to a form of incest. <laughs> you want to invite a variety of creative perspectives and, and thought into your music to try and make it distinctive. To do this, find pieces outside your field and think how they could be translated into feel of the field you are working in. I often think that Translation invites uh, sort of ambiguity and creativity, which helps with development as well. Another important thing to ensure when studying, much like anything, is motivation, at least for the most part. The reason being that motivation will help us see our studies through to the end, and if we see our studies through, we'll advance our development much more effectively as we've actually done the studying. <laughs> How then do we ensure motivation? The best way to ensure motivation is for us to study compositions that naturally inspire us. For this reason I am reticent to say there is a general definitive list of composers or resources any one person should study. Instead a large portion of our studies should be on those pieces that make us sit back in our chairs, make us smile or make us weep. If they provoke strong responses it's likely they'll you know, provoke our curiosity as well. If you love a piece of music and it makes you ask questions about its composition, this is likely going to motivate you to look at it. Or if an aspect of a musical composition makes you sit back in a ch your chair or struck, it could you know, stimulate that study as well. It could also give that f uh, study focus. For instance, you could be awestruck by a textural effect in a piece you've heard once or a thousand times. Therefore, you can study its texture, what makes you so awestruck by it. Or you might feel the arrangement of a musical work has a quirky edge to it. You might want to find out if there is an underlying musical uh, technique or device that is making you feel that way. If a piece instills a line of question, it's not only motivational due to your curiosity, but half the work is done already. We've lowered part of the resistance to our learning as we've given ourselves focus. If we are motivated, feeding our curiosity, the learning process will feel less like work and more like play. Contrary to the previous section, we should not solely indulge our interests, but we should challenge them too. While I think a large part of our studies can be of things we like, a dutiful proportion uh, should be of either music that we are unsure of or possibly even dislike. The reason for this is that we need to force expansion of our tastes and likes. 
otherwise we'll get caught in a comfort zone and our development will likely stagnate. Of course, this invites a greater risk of our studies for failing, but that is a risk that we really ought to take and need to take. If we use honeybees as an example, uh, they use something called a waggle dance to communicate the location of nectar. However, in all the colonies that scientists study, about 20% of bees ignore uh, this dance and roam in different directions. The reason being that if the colony focused solely on the nectar that they knew existed, they would exhaust those resources. Without knowledge of additional nectar sources, the colony could starve to death. The point that I'm trying to make is that I think the failure to expand our tastes or areas of study, at least gradually, will lead to a developmental stagnation. We'll essentially starve ourselves as, of, of knowledge or, or growth. For example, you might have experienced a gradual or significant decrease in the knowledge return of studying similar things, at least with regards to those aspects and perspectives of composition that can be mind-bending or paradigm-shifting on a personal level. In my experience, initial studies glean the most dramatic and broadly applicable information. An in-depth study, on the other hand, leads to the identification of deeper insights. These are incredibly valuable as well, however, some of these deeper details can be uh, more difficult and time-consuming to uncover. Therefore, it is worth exploring new things, even on a cursory level, uh, to complement those deeper studies as well. Finding things to study is probably the greatest barrier to studying at all. Uh, it's easier to be hampered by doubts that what we study is not worthwhile, will not provide us with uh, the knowledge we need to be what we want to become I guess. However, the reality is that the risk remains no matter what. In this sense, the value of exterior direction can be helpful. It is one of the things I valued most about my time at university and, and the teachers I had there. Instead of prescribing specific composers to study, most projects involved finding a composer, concept or composition to investigate, usually within the confines of a module's topic area. In completing these investigations, the teachers would often supplement uh, your work with suggestions, either generally in lectures or in response to the work that you were doing. Of course, university is not for everyone and my championing it, of it is personal. I felt it worked great for me, uh, but I know plenty of people you know, who might have different opinions or, um, or university might not be the best cause of action for them to develop as a composer or whatever. Therefore, an additional tactic for developing your taste is to pivot from your studies into a particular uh, composer or area of music. When you're listening to, or particularly reading about composers, what other names emerge? What references are made to other composers, resources, or uh, pieces of music, things like that? Once you've got a list of things from that, or you spot a name that's piqued your interest, you could seek them out and determine if they could be you know, the next pivot point the next individual to look at, the next piece or whatever. Obviously, the other things you can do are to go on forums and things like that and ask questions, uh, or if you are able to get a composition tutor or something like that, they can, that external person who's been through the process uh, or has a different perspective to yourself can offer, you know, good advice of where to go and things to look at. Many describe influences as a patchwork. I prefer to think of it as a, a cocktail, a cocktail where individual liquids represent an influence. The volume, therefore, is an indicator of the extent of an influential factor, but the strength is unknown until one takes a sip of the cocktail itself. I prefer this analogy, where one could look at a patchwork and view its influences. The inadequacies of taste are our only option for the cocktail. Things that influence us are not always obvious or observable. Reflecting on this analogy and the question of this article, there is a lot of anxiety surrounding what to study as a composer. However, we cannot know what pieces of music will resonate with us or what text will give us that piece of information that unravels a whole concept or perspective. What I take from Broke Music, you might take from Rock. What you take from Gustav Holst, I might take from John Williams. Instead, we have to allow ourselves the opportunity to find uh, those bits of information. We have to constrain ourselves to motivate and help us make choices, but remain open to music that challenges us as well. There will be more pieces of music and information that will not do anything for you as a composer than, than pieces that do. While the cocktail has many liquids, only a handful have a distinctive flavour.